Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. yeah? Oh, great. I love how everyone always sits in the last two rows, so we're going to have to walk back here and make sure you can hear us. Um, I'm Liz Goldberg. Um, I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine at the University of Colorado. This is my colleague, Dr. Damon Keel, and he is at Virginia Tech, and he's the vice chair of both research and academic affairs. So show of hands, who owns an Apple Watch? OK. Show of hands, who has taken care of a patient that's come to the ED because of an Apple Watch or other kind of technological device? Okay, and keep your hands up if you know how to interpret that data and the accuracy of that data. Okay, great, so you're in the right session. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we don't have any disclosures. We've both been fortunate to get NIH funding and um, industry funding um, involving tech, and please do reach out to us if you're ever interested in SBIRs or any kind of those mechanisms. It's really great how NIH is working with industry now, and that is one of our personal objectives to kind of advance uh, that kind of collaboration. So I think everyone here knows about the promise of technology, and specifically Jaren technology, which is technology for people 65 and older. We can monitor at home. You know, there's so many people with mobility. There's people out in rural settings. Isn't it wonderful that we can use telehealth? There's a way to reach people where they are now. Screening for diseases, you know, can we do glucose monitoring? What kind of things can we do in the home during COVID? I'm sure many of you sent folks out with pulse oximeters that can, you know, automatically upload into a health systems um, where you can see early detection of decompensation. Um, but what is on the tech horizon for geriatrics and specifically for emergency medicine? How does it intersect with emergency medicine? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start with a case. There's an 85, and I'm sure you've never seen a case like this. Um, there's an 85-year-old woman. She comes into your emergency department. She was at church, and um, she got an atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, AFib notification on her watch. And um, you know she's there now, and you're like, what do I do with this? She's never had atrial fibrillation before. Like, is she actually an AFib? Is this a real thing? How accurate is that data? How do I advise her? Like, clearly, like. Now I have to admit her, even though she's in sinus now on my EKG. Like, do I admit her? Do I say this was false positive? Like, how do I interpret this? So um, this is the first step that you should take, and I'm going to explain why. If you are able to, and if she has her phone, because there are standalone Apple Watches that actually do not, that uh, where the phone is at home with the caregiver, so you can get a data plan on your watch on your own. Um, so you want to navigate to this health app, and you actually want to look at that rhythm strip, which usually represents lead one. But it turns out you can actually put the Apple Watch like on the abdomen and in different places, and you can get multiple different leads. It's very cool what they're doing with this technology. And you want to select electrocardiograms, and you want to export that PDF to email, text, or upload. That's a whole tricky thing, like how you're going to do that in real time, I recognize. But this would be the best uh, next step after you see an AFib notification on a watch. But how accurate is this? So um, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021, Perez et al. published a very large uh, Apple-funded um, Apple Heart Study. They studied over 400,000 people. And if you got an AFib notification on your watch, they sent you a at-home um, telemetry device that would monitor you for seven days. And they looked, you know, compared to the, the folks that got the AFib notification, when we sent them that uh, telemetry device, it's validated to their homes, how many of them actually ended up having atrial fibrillation. And it turns out 34% overall in the 22 plus population, and slightly higher, 35% in the 65 plus population. So that gives you a positive predictive value of 0.85, which is not that great, right? But it turns out when cardiologists actually went back and they looked at the PDF of that um, <coughs> Apple Watch uh, print, it was 99% accurate for atrial fibrillation. So the actual notification you get on your watch 
is um, in, in uh, other research studies um, between 30 and 60 percent accurate. Um, but if you can look at that PDF and you clearly see atrial fibrillation, there's almost no false positives. So um, that's what I want you to take away from the Apple Watch um, story. And it turns out there's really high agreement between EKG and the IECG that you get in neonates, adults, and with congenital heart disease. But um, the Apple Watch is not for uh, heart attack detection. Um, right now, you're only getting notifications as AFib, inconclusive, or not AFib. So one of the big problems that we have, obviously, with the Apple Watch is, well, they don't wear it at night. Batteries run down, and they oftentimes get left um, on the bedside table when they're out for groceries, what have you. If you think of another case, um, anybody have any problems getting people admitted with syncope? I mean, it's not a double diagnosis. No, anybody? Again, show of hands. Yeah, your hospital just comes running to me. Everybody who passed out recently, I got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, odds a bit home. One of the things we're trying to talk about today is how can technology kind of fast forward care for patients, and certainly in the syncope world. Hey, uh, I don't want to admit you. I need to go to a cardiology clinic and get on this Holter monitor and uh, hopefully show up for that appointment. And I don't know how long you're going to wear it. And I would put it on you tonight, but the EKG lab closed at four. So, what do you do with this? I want to highlight what is now available to all of us as emergency physicians and not just cardiologists, which is truly advanced wearable devices. This, this market is exploding, and for many different reasons, it is perfect for our geriatric patient population. This is one example of a patient that we took care of, and one thing I will highlight, these things, you can put them on, you open up the package, and you put a sticker on it, and you're done. And it can work with their iPhone, or any kind of cell phone, and it is more accurate than an implantable loop recorder for detection of arrhythmias. Now, some of these devices are one-trick ponies. They are extraordinarily easy to use. They have AI in them. They report directly to the company. The company will then call the patient at home and say, um, how are you feeling? You can leave them on for 30 days. And that's what you should be doing in your older population. We miss a tremendous amount. We're going to put them in the office for a couple of days of monitoring. Stop that right now. And Holter no more. There's no reason to be doing two or three days of monitoring. I see I've got Dr. Moore in the audience here who will tell you we miss an incredible amount of patients with syncope of unexplained cause if we just monitor them for a short period. This is a patient who, again, fell out in church, and on day 18, we picked this up. And on day 19, she had her base maker. So let's actually go beyond just the one trick ponies. For our older population, it's incredibly easy to use, and emergency medicine should be pushing this right at the point of care or discharge. This is where we're going, though, with wearable devices, and what I want you to understand is this person is clearly got a high frailty index. You're worried about them. They don't really have admission criteria. Can you watch them from afar using some device? Well, the answer is yes. For something about $6 a day, the size of a quarter that they don't forget, it's on. They can take a shower with it. It's rechargeable. They can wear it forever. Did you move today? Did you walk? We can debate all day long the problems associated with it. Is the BP in some of these accurate? Is the O2 saturation accurate? I don't care. The value of these are temperature, movement, right? And now we're actually able to start assessing without a physical therapist, because you've got them all in your department 24 hours a day, occupational therapist too, right? Some of these devices we're working in our biomechanical engineering lab at DT, our group is focusing on, can this even replace an assessment for gait and frailty with speed, and we're calling it weevil wobble factor? And imagine putting that on and having them walk around the emergency department for a while and getting a report, that's, that's here today. That's here today. Now, we'll talk about what the future of some of these devices are, but again, sleep cadence, and I haven't seen you move in a while. Some of you have virtual OBS programs. Uh, you know, we have a virtual patient monitoring center that can track these patients. Hey, I'm going to get you up and running, and we're just going to have a tech keep an eye on you and make sure that you got out of bed in the morning when I sent you home. It's a real possibility. It's easy, and many of them are very low cost. 
is just the beginning, but that is perfect for our patients with precision emergency medicine for the for their appropriate patient cell. So here's another example of how you might want to use this technology. Um, you're seeing a 77-year-old. Uh, they're involved in a motor vehicle accident, and they didn't see the light was red. So actually, in six states across the United States, you are a mandatory reporter of folks that are driving, and you think they may no longer be able to drive due to cognitive impairment or other related issues. and. Um, we can already do this. So there's actually validated tools that we can do on iPads, on um, iPhones to assess cognition. And this is a screenshot from my uh, K Award study. We're actually using Apple's research kit to do cognitive and fitness assessments in ED patients in real time when they're there. And um, our research has shown, um, this is one of my mentees, you can look up the study exactly how we're doing that and how we're using that, but research has shown that older adults, even with cognitive impairment, can use iPads, can use touch devices. And so this is sort of what's on the horizon for us. Can go back to that slide mm -hmm. How many of you actually take the time to do cognitive impairment screening? Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of AGEM folks in yeah, here, I, yeah. No. But to do it well and do it right and get everybody on board, why not have AI and a robot do it for you? And the patients really respond to this too. Like, while you're waiting for your blood test, I'd like you to play some video games, right? And, and this is a real opportunity that we are not leveraging yet the many and myriad number of companies that actually have this available to them uh, is, is truly, shame on us for not deploying some of these technologies where we don't take the time anyway and don't screen for this. But everybody who runs a stop sign in the emergency department who, who is older adult should have this type of And it's available and it's not going to create any more cognitive load for you. But you will have a tool that you can do something in action on. So. This is what I'm working on. So we work backwards to really understand what are the boundary conditions that lead to an actual injury from a fall. This comes from our Virginia Tech Comet Lab. And trying to actually define right, what type of fall will lead to a certain type of injury. And we're actually testing some of these novel wearable devices in combination with human pose estimation to see can a cheap device not only predict a fall, but a serious head strike or a hip fracture. Imagine, if you will, at a skilled nursing facility that you get a report of the type of fall, since nobody saw it but the robot, and the energy transmitted. So please consider a hip x-ray in this patient who is demented. Um, and also, don't do a head CT. They didn't hit their head. That's where I want to go. But some of these devices, as companies are emerging and developing those, as, as, as we're working with in our human injury lab, that's where we want to get to. But we can use a lot of that technology even right now. There's even cooler stuff that she's doing. So we have a SBIR study where we are um, testing ingestible sensors that can actually tell you and their caregiver if that person took their medication. Um, other things are we have a sensor that we put into diapers and it can actually alert nursing home staff that like the diaper is now wet, please go change that diaper. So. Um, very cool ways to, pre to, to prevent injuries, uh, decubitus <laughs> ulcers, uh, medication adherence issues, with the goal, really, of keeping people independent. Um, there's other real-time sensors with predict predictive analytics. We are very close, I think, to having a sensor that tells you, like, you are about to fall, like your gait pattern, your cognitive features, your fitness features, um, put you at super high risk for falls. Um, and we have some fall prediction, uh, prediction with AI gate assessment um, coming soon. So uh, very exciting technologies that we're going to be hearing about a lot more in the future. So one of the things that I always talk about is we have to slow down when it comes to our older adults and think about all of the pieces of that care. And in the end, though, a lot of the emerging technology and technology that exists can fast forward many of those screenings and picking up and finding certainly 
many different disease processes that we hadn't even thought of. Your weight room and knowing when they get the fever, heart rate variability for early detection of sepsis on that person who's always just got kind of a low blood pressure, they're all here now. And they are perfect because many of them don't have cables, which is awesome. So we do believe that tech can really get us to precision emergency medicine for our older adults, and we're really, really excited about your technology and what's coming. And we wanted to try to finish early to hear from all of you of what kind of cool tech are you deploying in your emergency department to really fast forward their care and, and do it with precision. So thank you very much, but I want to, we want to hear from you. So, I could so if you order telemetry on a patient in your emergency department, that's a facility side charge that is hundreds of dollars. Hundreds, right? So there is a wearable device code for Medicare that the facility side charge of placing it and sending them home is probably 700 pesos. Dr. Moore about that, right? You interpreting that as a physician at some point, they give you 30 bucks. But the facility site charges are covered in a global fee for an emergency department visit, and home monitoring um, has many codes for it as well. So even inpatient or in your waiting room, you can bill for telemetry services using a wearable device. And it's already in there. And we're already sending, at my shop, we're sending folks home with a Zio patch, and they don't get admitted for syncope. Oh, they go, <laughs> take it all back. <laughs> Good question. I mean, I don't think that answer, the answer has been, uh, you know, fully elucidated yet. Like, if you're the one, you know, if you're sending someone home with a patch for, like, syncope detection, you definitely want to have already pre-established pathways for who follows that up, and, and who, the onus is typically not on the ED in that case. But um, we could take ownership of this. That could be a potential source of, um, you know, revenue for us as emergency physicians. <coughs> we built this system at OHSU and as a research fellow there, and I took a call for two years straight on um, the follow-up. Fortunately, it was just nine to five because we used an external loop recorder that didn't have real-time capabilities. The real-time capabilities are the issue, so you have 24-hour monitoring that can fire at any time of the day. Um, we're going to route ours to our ED ops provider who is on 24-7 uh, to take that call and determine if they actually do have to come back to the emergency department. Um, and OHSU, the emergency department handled it for a few years, but it became overwhelming with the number of patches that got placed. Uh, and so ultimately, cardiology was kind enough to take over the follow up the interpretation. Um, we used a we used a, a wearable device that was a 14 day external loop recorder. It was not real time. And the issue that we found with that for syncope is you don't find out until three weeks later after the device has been mailed back to the company and the report's been generated that your patient actually had run some sustained VTAC for two minutes while they Whoops. So that's why in the research that we're doing in our shop currently, we've, we've funded out to real-time monitoring because the miss rate for sinus bradyarrhythmia, sorry, bradyarrhythmias requiring pacemakers was 4.5%, which is well above what we've established as our acceptable threshold of misses at 2%. So a good point with that. You know, we're telling you what's on the horizon. We're obviously very excited about it. We've bought into it, but we do not we don't have clinical validation studies for all this tech. Sometimes tech is introduced and we don't really know how to interpret it as evidenced by you know, your show of hands earlier. So that is where we can really take onus over the field and be like, we need to partner with these companies to make sure that it works for our patients, that it's equitable, um, that we have like clinical pathways, that it works within our ED setting. But there's so much opportunity there. As we discussed in the census conference, certainly in my group, and emerging technology for precision, we have to be at the table with them. They have solutions for us. We just have to guide them and how they're deployed and get that evidence. And, and there's many shops that are doing some of this work, but as a collective, our older adult patient population is who benefits 
almost the most for most of the Yeah, exactly. Uh, more than general. We have a virtual observation unit. So yeah, we're no. sending people with a um, one channel home for our party monitor, but the one channel that we have to have the Now, if, if you're truly sending them home with an understanding that I'm worried about arrhythmia, there are right now two devices that you should be using. Now, can you deploy some of the emerging devices have an extra add-on that would be a three lead EKG with them that really improves that fidelity that single leads are a disaster for safety um, and, and arrhythmia infection. They are. They have incredible value in so many other domains as I was talking about. But if you are really thinking about arrhythmia detection for a three days, then you want to flip over to a new device. So, so <clears throat> I just maybe tee up but um, I actually had a STEMI myself um, about eight weeks ago. Sorry. Um, well, obviously, I did fine. But actually, the reason why I'm telling this story right now and again in 10 minutes um, <laughs> is actually my Apple Watch. Sorry brand name, uh, said, hey, wow, well, your heart rate is really slow when I'm out for a run. And then I clicked on my ECG reading, and I was actually in a junctional rhythm. And you can clearly see the reciprocal uh, compression in the blood within probably mm -hmm. two minutes. So yeah, I've heard anecdotes like that. I've heard people like falling out in the wilderness and the Apple Watch automatically called 911. I mean, there's some really great stories out there. We don't just we just don't have a lot of prospective research that you know, I suggest mean, that we should use this for everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.